Welcome to Capital Life Church. Lisa said I have an interesting message to share with you and in content here, and I do. I'm starting a two-Sunday, two-week here a series on heaven and hell. And very rarely do we hear this type of preaching in churches. And I don't know if it's the weather outside or what, but I'm going to start with hell. So get ready. <laughs> get ready for uh, that. I remember being back at, um, and laugh while you can, because it goes deep. You get what I mean. Um, back at the uh, Roslyn Spectrum Performing Arts Theater when we met there, uh, Synetic Theater used to meet in that facility. And many of you know the story that Synetic Theater would do dramas and we could not change whatever they put up on the stage. So if you've, if you've joined Capital Life Church since we've been in this building, you don't know what I'm talking about, but others do. And that is that um, they could have just pretty much anything as art, as their artwork that they displayed in the lobby, and then they could have anything that they would have dramas about. Now, some were neutral. Uh, and that, one of the neutral ones was a one-man show that was about a caveman. And so up on the stage were rocks that looked like Fred Flintstone type stuff and, and a TV set made out of a stone. I, it was just unique and different. That's neutral. I wouldn't have minded that. I mean, at that time, I can preach about David in the caves running from King Saul because they put it all together for us so we didn't have to pay for it. But we didn't know what we would get until we got there. The artwork would be at times like a quote. And there was a quote that was on one of the walls, and it meant nothing. The quote meant nothing. I don't even remember what it was. It was just a nothing quote. And people would come in thinking of all the quotes this church could have put up. They put that up. <laughs> and then they see the art that is right over the children's area, and there's the big portrait. I mean, poster-sized portrait of Saddam Hussein, and he is pointing down at the kids in anger. <laughs> And we can't remove it, and we can't cover it, because it's theirs. I mean, this is owned by the, the building, and we can't touch it. One time, it was a 30-foot-high spider that had fangs and beady red eyes that glowed in the dark, and then a sack of spider eggs that I got to preach right next to the sack. Now, there's nothing in seminary to tell you how to do those things. But one time, it was Dante's Inferno. And uh, maybe some of you have not read that. I actually knew about it. I've never read it. And my daughter, Sydney, was telling me, because she had to read it in school, that it was about levels of hell. Now it makes sense to me what was up on the stage and all over the lobby. It was all done in dark uh, velvet around it or dark curtains and stuff. And then you had splashes of red that I didn't know whether it was blood or flames or what it was. And you had spider webs and you had coffins. And how do you do church when you have all of that up? And not just for a week. They like to go six to eight week runs with what they would do. Thank God we're here and in this building now. Um, you can applaud that. So heaven and hell and, uh, and starting uh, here with hell. I know that... Um, that we probably all have been to funeral services or a eulogy service. And I've been to a num number of them in my lifetime. And it's a time where people finally pause for a brief moment before getting back into all the things that uh, are the hubbub of life and the, are expected of us and all that stuff. And we pause for a moment to consider the afterlife. It's a rarity that people do. It's a rarity that people really just sit and think about it or have intelligent conversations about what happens when you draw your last breath on this earth. Where do you go? And, um, and when you're in a funeral service, and I've been in some where it just kind of gets unusual as to how people encourage one another sometimes. And I remember being at a, a funeral where uh, a high school student had died, and uh, his friends were coming up to the microphone, and, and, and we were hearing things like, well, I know he's still alive. He didn't really die because um, I, I, I saw him on my windowsill, 
And we're like, what? Where is this going? And he was a bird. And he's now this bird that comes and visits me, and, and he's still living. But that's all that person knew to have an understanding of some sort of comfort. And, and, and they had the feeling that they had to give comfort, and they didn't know how to give it. I've heard things about the loved one is a star in the sky, and at night I remember the brilliance of their life and who they are to me and what they meant to me. And you hear all types of things, and one would assume when we go to church that there's a biblical uh, perspective to the afterlife. But the reality is it's, it's rather shocking the amount of ideas that are out there of what happens. Of course, the atheist will say that when you draw your last breath on this earth, it's done. That's it. And I was talking to my girls this past week, probably the only father doing this, talking to them about hell, but I have to process my message. And, and, uh, and I said, I, I, I'm trying to immerse myself into an atheist viewpoint for a moment with this idea that there's nothing after death. So that means then that Hitler got away with it. And that there are murderers and rapists that just simply get away with it. And that means I'll never see my loved ones again. And that means that there is no truth. It's all relative and conditional and all of that. And I didn't want to sit there in that place for too long thinking along those lines. But I'll tell you what I want to do with this series, two-part series. I want to provoke you to consider the afterlife, and I want you to consider a biblical perspective. Why? Why does it matter? If I've accepted Christ, I know I'm going to heaven. Why does it matter? And I hope that through this message, you will begin to understand why it matters. And I hope that it will so flavor your thinking that you will begin to see others differently. And then there'll be a sense of urgency and a sense of a broken heart where it needs to be, but a sense of joy where it needs to be. And all of that in a way that is God's truth and not my opinion or your opinion. So that's what I'm hoping to do in this. Believe me when I say this is not a a comprehensive understanding of hell, because the more I got into it, the deeper it got, the more there was to it. And the more I realized I can only whet the appetite, hopefully, for you to study. And I will give you some scriptures without reading them through at one part in the message that if you would like to write them down, I, I will just, I'll give you the references so that you can study this out to a greater degree. And believe me, you already came today, so you're going to hear about hell, but you're going to want to come next week to hear about heaven after what I'm going to tell you. So... Do we have that biblical uh, view? And if we have a biblical view of hell, it's going to flavor whether or not we witness. We're going to see evangelism different rather than just some people are called to evangelism and I applaud them and I respect that, but it's not me. We're going to see our role as believers different in regard to witnessing evangelism missions. So that when you hear about a mission team going to Niger, or you hear from Capital Life Church, or you hear about a mission team going to Thailand, or you hear about a mission team going to Haiti, or wherever it may be, that you'll begin to capture a sense of God's heart for why we go. That it's all right to think, well, I've never been to another part of the world. I, I wouldn't mind that. I'd kind of like to see what that area is like. I, I have the ability to do some travel, and I'd like to do travel. That's not a bad thought, but that's not the hub of the wheel. The hub of the wheel is we do these things because we have cried out for God's heart, and he's given us his heart, and we believe Jesus came for a reason, and he didn't die on a cross so that we could have good, moral, loving teachings. Oh, he did that. Certainly, he gave the greatest teachings ever taught, but that was not why he had to die. Others have come and given good teachings. Others have come and told us that we should love. Jesus did much more than that. And when we capture that heart, we know why we go to the uttermost parts of the earth to tell people about Jesus. And we go in our own backyard and to our own families, even though we know we might have to hunker down because they may not believe the way that we believe. 
but we need to love them with God's love. I heard one amen. Let's hear another one. It's going to be harder to amen a little later in this message, so amen while you can, uh, if you will. So it, it not only flavors how we view evangelism and witnessing and missions, but it also gives us a sense of the hereafter, this in regard to heaven and hell, that we have hope and we have joy because we know that this earth is not all. And we know that the one that we adore and worship and regard and respect, we will see face to face. And we know that our departed loved ones that are in the Lord we will be able to see them again and join with them again in heaven. And we know that the injustices of this earth and all of these things will have their place where they are properly brought into alignment. And that is, again, a reason not to avoid heaven and hell as an issue uh, from the pulpit and here in the church as a congregation. Now, the Bible is clear that there are only two, catch it, only two Final destinations. It is heaven and hell. You will hear all types of things from people. You will hear people say that uh, there uh, is a, a purgatory. There's nothing in the scriptures to show that. There's a, uh, perhaps people will say there's some third option. And certainly the atheists will say there's no option at all. But the Bible only declares uh, that there is a heaven and a hell. Now, with heaven, there, I'll talk more about that in regard to. Uh, heaven and the new earth and all of these things, but all of that is what I mean by heaven, that it sets forth an understanding that there is a place of great despair and a place of great hope. And, uh, and the word is, uh, of God is very, very clear on this. Now, I have oftentimes thought that it's probably uh, difficult for most people to preach on the subject of hell uh, because it's so unpopular. Uh, I have uh, touched on it at uh, different times, but uh, but never had a really a message just solely on hell. And again, I've brought it in to messages, but not just solely on hell. And um, because I don't want everybody to just Debbie Downer leaving the place kind of a thing. But as I immersed myself in this this last week, it really was a sense for something much deeper as to why I think uh, this is a very difficult subject to handle. Because... When, you're, when you immerse yourself in the scriptures and you're hearing, reading the very words of our Lord Jesus, it begins to bring you to a place of brokenness. And it's a place in which you look at this and there's an overwhelming sense that you got to do something about this, but you don't have the power to do it. And that's when you begin to look in the word of God and see, but somebody did something who had the power to do it. And this isn't a message about a God that doesn't love. This is a message about a God that loves so deeply that he sent his only son to die on the cross. What a powerful, powerful thing. Let's give God the glory for that. <laughs> Matthew 7, and I'm paraphrasing with this because there are different versions of the scriptures with it. But Matthew 7, I believe it's the 13th and 14th verses talking about wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. But narrow is the gate and straight is the road that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. I want you to capture with me this idea that, that one is broad and wide and so many people going through that broad area. And you can see the masses that are moving in that direction. And then I want you to see over here that narrow and straight is the road that leads to eternal life. So you've got this idea then that if, if that's in any way now, uh, uh, something that I could translate to something very literal with this, it means to me that the majority of people that I will meet in life are not going to heaven. It means that the majority of people that I work with or, or that I rub shoulders with or maybe family members will not make it to heaven. And that in and of itself begins to weigh on you with the idea that this gospel isn't just another set of ideas. This gospel sets us free, gives us freedom. Liberty from what we deserve. 
ability to know God and the love that God has for us and the love that God has for, I believe, all mankind, that we were made in our mother's wombs and we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that that there's a calling upon our lives and God is wanting us to see that he has made a way by which we can know that calling and walk in our true identity and we don't have to have this lesser appetite for the things of the world that just are like fireworks. They go up in the air and they go brilliantly in the sky, ooh and ah, till it drops like ashes to the ground. That's sin. Feels like the ooh and the ah, and the next thing you know, it comes down and it's worthless ash. God has better for us than that. That's why it's not just a prayer to accept Jesus, because why not? But we begin to see this sense of why God did what he did, creating mankind and sending his son, and before that, his kings and his judges and his prophets, all of whom were put to death, or most of whom were put to to death as they sought to point towards God, they couldn't be the bridge. God finally sent the most precious possession he had. He sent his only son, Jesus. And now with Jesus coming to earth, what do we as mankind do to him? We want to stay the way we're living. We don't want to feel shame or guilt. So we want to put him on a cross, call him a fool, put him up there and say he's a criminal like any other criminal, whatever it may be. And we crucify him on that cross. And all the while, he's the one bringing us hope. He's the one bringing us a way by which we don't have to live by shame and guilt. That's who he is. That's the power of the gospel. That's why we need to leave here free and can't leave here less than that. Now, this may not be a shock to you, but more people believe in heaven than believe in hell. I looked at a lot of different stats over the last 10 years. The most recent stats that I could find are these. 72% of people believe in heaven. 58% believe in hell. G.K. Chesterton said these words. Hell is God's compliment. That sounds strange. Hell is God's complement to the reality of human freedom and dignity of choice. We all have choices to make. God did not strip you of your dignity, whereby he says he forces you to love him. He doesn't force you to believe in biblical truth. God doesn't do that. He gives you the ability to have a choice. You're not robotic. You're an individual that has choices. And there are people who have cast their choice in the direction of defying God. There are people who have cast their choice in the direction of ignoring God. There are ones who say he doesn't exist. There are ones who are, want to paint him in a certain way to say, I wouldn't serve a God like that, so I serve myself. Whatever it may be, I'm telling you, you have a choice. I've seen the ones who have made the choice towards Jesus. I've seen the hospitals and orphanages that have been built by people of faith. I've seen the people that have witnessed and cared for people when they've gone through their greatest sorrows and will not let them go because they understand the unconditional love of God and they know what it is to bring the comfort of God. You have a choice as to how you're going to live. It's up to you. But your choice doesn't change God. And your choice doesn't change God's truth. Your choice of whether you accept him or reject him doesn't make him, poof, go away. He exists whether you believe he does or not. He made you whether you buy into that story or not. You will go one place or the other when you die, whether you buy into the story or not. It's the truth of the Word of God. To decide, then, if we think about it, is a God-given thing. We have the right to choose. Now, I'm telling you that there are some individuals that will say, no, I'm going to make the choice for somebody else because I don't like their choice. So I'm going to get a gun, and I'm going to go into a place, and I'm going to shoot it up or whatever it may be. I'm going to do this or that because I don't like the choices that are being made. So I'm going to be God in this moment, and I'm going to do Listen, people have a right to make a choice, maybe a bad choice, maybe a good choice, maybe a choice that leads them to repercussions that you would have tried to have saved them from. But they have a right, God-given right, to make that choice. 
And I'm thankful for that because I do believe that Chesterton is right. I do believe that God has given us the dignity of being able to make that choice. So let me ask this question here for a moment. And maybe it's a question that you've asked in the past, and that is, but is hell fair? Is hell overkill? Is it too much of a punishment? And you may be in a conversation with a person at work or whatever, and they don't believe in the God that you believe in. They don't believe in Jesus. And they say, uh, how can you, and this is really what it comes down to at the crux of the matter. How can you believe in a God that's not a loving God? How can a God of love send people to hell? And then if they don't think they've won their argument well enough, they're going to go to the next step. How can God send innocent children to hell? There is a painting of Napoleon The painting of Napoleon has him standing there, and it was uh, painted after his desire to have world domination, which was unsuccessful, in case you didn't know that. But, um, and you see around him, you can see the people writhing and crying out in pain, and little children with fists lifted. And the whole idea is because Napoleon took the lives that he took and tried to dominate the world in that way that, that he is in hell. And look at all these people in hell with him. And that viewpoint is there by the world that certainly if there is a God, I don't want to serve him because he's not a loving God if he would send children to hell. First of all, let me focus in on the children to hell thing just for a moment for you. In Isaiah 716, the Bible starts a scripture, a verse there by saying, it begins with, for before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. I want you to stop for a moment and see there that really what uh, the prophet is saying there is that there is a time in which there is not an accountability to one's decisions in childhood. They don't have a maturity and and a depth of uh, of, of understanding to make the decisions that would send a child to heaven or hell. What we do know is this. In the scriptures, there's not one analogy of hell, not one story of hell that was shared uh, in the Bible that's, that places a child in hell, not one. But you do have analogies of children in heaven, and the correlation of children and salvation is in the scriptures. So it's a false argument to say that God sends innocent children to hell. But still, what are we looking at when we talk about uh, a God of love sending people to hell? Again, I'm wanting to whet your appetite for you to begin to think more deeply in regard to the afterlife from a biblical perspective. God is love. God is love. God is love, and he is unconditional love, and it is true. And the message of God's love is a desperate message that people need. The people are in desperation need that message of God is love, and he loves you. And that is all true, but God is also just. And the God that loves must also, in his moral and ethical code that he has set forth, there will be repercussions to sin. I would love for the thought of there being no prisons. I'd love for every prison to be converted over to uh, a place uh, that helps people and churches and orphanages and, and hospitals and all the like. But there's a necessity for prison because people will do what they do and must be constrained, and they will choose to do those things. And we have set a law in the United States of America, and different nations have laws so that they can have those laws such that people don't do just whatever they choose to do in their way. God is love, but he must punish sin. It's fascinating that the current day version of Jesus, you want me to give it to you? The current day version of Jesus is that he is a messenger of love. That's good. 
It's right on. It's not off, but it's not everything. Jesus is the good moral teacher that gives the messages of love, and he is constantly wanting people to know that they're not judged, and whatever they do, it's okay. And I just love you. I just, I just love you. And But I just killed my grandma. I love you anyway. And he does love anyway, in the sense that he will seek to redeem you. But isn't it fascinating that the one who spoke more on hell than any other in Scripture is Jesus? In fact, he spoke more about hell than he spoke about heaven. Why? Is it possible? Go with me here for a moment. Is it possible that that is love? To warn people of something you know to be real. To give people every opportunity not to have to go to hell, but to go to heaven. To not only warn and be the primary principal person to give the warning in Scripture, but to go beyond that and give your life's blood and die on a cross, a shameful death as you're naked on the cross and spit at and the crown of thorns, and all that he went through because he loves you. And the world has distorted that to a place of saying that God is not a God of love, that God is just a a God without standards. And all of this, there's no holiness, there's no righteousness, there's just whatever, however we want to live and whatever works for you is good for you, whatever works for me is good for me. And the world has gotten into, it's a little bird on my window that's talking to me. That's who the person. And we've gotten into these way out there concepts. It's time that we return to the word of God and see what the Bible has to say about all of this. The penalty of sin is spiritual death, but the gift of God is, is uh, life through Jesus Christ, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Whatever hell is, Jesus really went out of his way to warn us about it. And whatever hell is, Jesus literally went to the deepest of pains to save us from it. So what is hell? I talked about Dante's Inferno uh, and the whole setup back where we used to meet at, for church. And when I was talking to my girls about it, my youngest daughter, Sydney, was telling me again what that was and that it was talking about levels of hell. And again, this is not a biblical concept so much, but depending on how bad you did in this world is how deep the level is that you're in. I think people have difficulty with the concept that the uh, mom of three children who has done her best to uh, bring up her three kids was a fairly good person, didn't harm anybody, but got in an accident in, the ve- in her vehicle and, was, uh, and died, will be in the same place that uh, Adolf Hitler is in. And what is the fairness value in what that looks like and everything? So in Dante's Inferno, I think perhaps that's kind of an idea of this sense of trying to answer that. We don't know specifically what all that means of the levels. I know that I'm about to show you different ways that, uh, that the scriptures describe hell. And in these different ways, I can tell you, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of prefer the outer darkness to the bottomless pit. And I'd kind of prefer the bottomless pit to the, to the worms that eat you. And I'd kind of prefer the worms that eat me to the perpetual fire. And it's like, oh, maybe that's what's meant by that. Because people look at this as a very literal, it's going to be perpetual fire. Or a literal, it's going to be this sense of, of being in outer darkness. Or literal, it's going to be this or that. There is a literal hell. Jesus made that clear. But people will line up on different sides as to what hell is. So let's, if you're taking notes on this, hell has been compared to a bottomless pit. Now, uh, that's found in Revelation 20, verse 1. And I can uh, say that I have never had the nightmare of the bottomless pit. I think I, there used to be like an old TV show that showed somebody going like this forever through and never really hitting the base of the pit. Um, my, my nightmare ha- has been that I can't find my class at school and everybody already started class and I can't find it. Now, I can, I can get healed of that now and let it go because I'm not in classes like that anymore. But that's still, for some people, it's the, 
I'm out in public. I'm naked. No one else is. Okay, whatever your nightmare is with that. I've never had the bottomless pit one. But even that sense of bottomless pit there is, is this description of, uh, of hell. The second is a lake of fire. We see that in Revelation 20, verse 14, a lake of fire. That's not the only place where we see a reference of hell being like fire uh, or, or being fire. The third is a place of torment, Revelation 20, verse 10. Number four is a dump where fire perpetually burns and worms uh, feast. And one of the words uh, used for hell in the Bible is the word Gehenna. Gehenna was a garbage dump in the valley of uh, Hinnom. And Jesus was using this dump as an analogy of hell because people would bring all of their refuse uh, there and they would bring, they'd bring their trash and then they would burn the trash. And it was a constant sense that was, this was the city's place to bring their trash, to burn it. And because some of that trash was stuff that worms like, worms are just perpetually uh, feasting. Forgive me, because I know this is before food and we before lunch. Number five, darkness and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 25, 30. And then the last one I want to focus in on here for a moment, and this is not a comprehensive list. But it's clear uh, in, in the scriptures that it's a place of being cut off from God. And, and that idea right there is, is very, very uh, interesting because, again, I go back to something my daughter Sydney said when we were together talking about hell this week in our um, breakfast room. And she said, well, I said to them, to the girls, what do you think hell is? Because sometimes uh, younger people have a much better perspective on things than we that have gone through a lot of life and think we know have. And, and her response was, uh, a part of her response was to say, well, I think it's, it's the knowledge of it. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, when you're in hell, you're going to have the knowledge that God is authentic. He is real. He is that God of love that you rejected. And Jesus did come to die on the cross for you, and you didn't accept him. And the knowledge, in, in other words, the regret of that, which goes to this terminology of gnashing of teeth and the torment that we read about in the sense of regret. And I thought, that's pretty deep. Good job, Sid. That's a deep one there. And I think that that would be true. But think for a moment with me on this. Let's say hell is outer darkness. I mean, it's, it's darkness, absolute pitch dark. Well, if it's also a perpetual fire, wouldn't that light the darkness? Let's say it's and forgive me again, because lunch is around the corner, and some of you are even munching little snacks right now. Um, let's say it's worms. They're feasting. Wouldn't the fire consume the worms? And so you look at this, and I know that there are people who will fight for one or another literal translation of it. But what I have come to the conclusion of, this is my journey in this, and you can, I want to whet your appetite. You, you have a choice. You tell me what you feel on it. But I believe being cut off from God is really what every one of these are describing. So to give you an example of what I'm feeling here, um, a perpetual fire is excruciating, but we won't understand this side of heaven, what being cut off from God really is. Because God and the remnant people of God are holding back great judgment from the earth. God and the remnant people of God are keeping things from going a direction that would be completely all about me and not about God. 
And when things are all about you and all about me, just watch the directions we'll go. If there's no God and no justice in the universe, just watch. You think the things in the last couple of days have been bad in the news. Just imagine where people will go when there's a removal of God's presence from it. And even God's presence, we could get theological about what all that means, but I'm getting the thought across to you that if an individual is cut off from God's love, watch out. Why? Because God is love. God is healing. God is deliverance. If you can't be delivered from what is, is tormenting you at that point, that's hell. And if there's no hope because hope is found in Christ, I'm hopeless. And if I have a sense of woundedness and there's no healing, I have no sense that I can ever have healing. I'm stuck. And whether we find and in time and hopefully not by direct finding it by going to hell, but in time learning about hell, if we're in heaven, and I don't know if that'll happen with the details of it, that hell is a perpetual fire, and it is this, and it is that, and it's all literal. I'm absolutely open to the concept of these things, but I believe that this is God himself. Jesus of Nazareth is not just a man, and God himself is sharing with mere finite human beings what hell is like who have never experienced it. And he even uses a dump that's not far away to describe it so that we can get a sense that it's not only a place we don't want to go, it's a place that would be a place that we would never want anyone to go. We wouldn't even want to visit such a place as that. And so I think that there's much to be said for the idea that that Hell is being cut off from God and all that God is, and all that he is. Not only that, being cut off from those who believe in God, who would also be standard carriers for things that would represent and reflect the heart of God. All of that is no longer your company. Now, I remember when uh, Ted Turner, who is the founder of CNN, and back in the day when CNN came on, it was pretty revolutionary. Some of you may uh, have enough time in your lives that you've experienced to remember back then. But, um, but Ted Turner made a statement that if he had a choice, if there is something after life, he would choose hell. And I'm paraphrasing. He said, because I like women now uh, to be with whoever I want to be. I, I, and he starts listing the things that he that he, of the way, what he likes and how he lives. He said, so for me, I wouldn't want a God. I'd want to continue doing what I'm doing with no restraint. I wonder if this thing, heaven and this thing, hell is really a natural conclusion to what we're already living. In the sense that if we are after God's heart and we desire to be in the presence of the Lord and we desire to worship him, which brought you people here today, all of us here today, then that would be a, a desire for us to have for eternity, only more. But if we want God to get out of our business, I want to live for myself. I don't want to be in a place where God is the center. I want to be in a place where I'm the center. And if we're at that stage, it's a natural thing to be cut off from God. We're just saying, take it to the conclusion. And in that, we have a choice. And then I begin to understand a loving God. He won't force it, even in eternity. We'll just get what we've always been after. And that's up for you to discuss. Reminds me of what? Saturday Night Live? Hell is real. Discuss. You know, or whatever that was. You guys, this generation won't know that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, Jessica McClure in Midland, Texas, uh, she was a little girl that the entire world found out about. Um, she was at her aunt's home. She was playing with some friends. The aunt 
went away from where they were for just a moment. I don't know if it was to get a phone call or to get a drink or something. Came, and then all of a sudden, the other little kids came running in and saying, Jessica's fallen. She's fallen in the well. We know her as baby Jessica because she was just 18 months of age. This is back in 1987. And she got somehow over the well and fell down 22 feet. Within three minutes, the Midland Fire Department and Police Department got to the scene to see what they could do. But because the level was down to 22 feet, we're talking about the ground that they have to go through is going to be like granite. And they can't get through this shaft that she went down because it's not only 22 feet, it's eight inches wide. How do you put a person down through that to lower them down in to get her and bring, bring them back up? And they didn't know what to do at first. And people began to come from around the area to say, I'll help. I've got an idea. And one of them was a man that, uh, that it was interesting about uh, his life because he, he was a, a roofing contractor who was born without collarbones. OK, this story gets kind of interesting. And this means that he is able to collapse his shoulders in order to fit in tighter spaces. That's my daughter, Aubrey. I know her laugh. Something caught her funny in that. I'm preaching on hell. What? Oh, OK. Yes, the collapsing. I know. You're getting mental images. They didn't use him. He's muscular, but collapsible. But they didn't use him. Um, but they brought in a machine. The machine was a machine that was used to dig the holes to put in telephone poles. And with this machine, it was powerful. And they began to use that to see if that would work. They did end up drilling what was a 30-inch wide, 29-foot par parallel hole next to the hole to the well. They could hear baby Jessica down there. And they could even tell what mood she was in. Because at times, she would growl or grunt with the pain that she was going through or whatever. And at other times, you could hear her kind of sigh like she was getting rest from it. But they were trying to keep her in communication so they could keep her mind off of whatever she felt having dropped so low and hitting so hard, and that there's hope here. So they would listen to where she was at to see how they could tag it to help her. And you know what it was that was the song that she was singing down there and that they all joined in because if she's singing it, let's join in with it. Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, chubby little cubby all stuffed with love. Okay. They're all in on it. They're all singing it. That means there's hope. They bring her up and it took uh, all together. 58 hours, 58 hours, CNN News covering it 24-7. Everybody's watching. That's what really made 24-7 news take off, because most people thought nobody's going to want to watch the news more than once during the day. It's too depressing. There was a Pulitzer Prize winning photo that captured baby Jessica after she got out of the well. Uh, in this, you can see that uh, her little face in the middle there. And I want you to see for a moment the intensity of those that are around her. She looks kind of clueless, perhaps. But look at the intensity on that guy on the right. Look at how everybody's focusing. Look how everybody's doing whatever they can do at that moment. We have people that are dying and going to hell without knowing God loves them. I mean, maybe they've heard about it, but they haven't experienced it without having received Jesus as their savior. And they're not ever going to know heaven because wide and broad is this one. And narrow and straight is this one. And most of us move through life as if it's not really that big a deal. Or a reality. William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, is a spiritual hero of mine. He lived a hundred 
uh, years ago, and uh, he was in London, England. Many of you are aware of the Salvation Army, and it came about this way. He had a vision. It's like a dream when he was awake, but his eyes were closed, and he knew it was given to him by God. And he could see in this vision that there were people that were in what is the ocean, and they were going, they, they were fighting to keep their heads above water so that they would be able to breathe. And he saw this, and then he watched as a rock came up out of the water until it came and came above the water, and there was a platform there, and there some of those individuals that were drowning in the water were able to get up on the platform and bring themselves up. And at that moment, he felt his only sense of encouragement in the midst of what he was seeing that some are making their way out of the water. In fact, everybody up on the ledge or up further up on the rock had all been in the same place that these that were drowning were in, but they had made their place to safety, their way to safety. And then he saw that there were some that had made their way to safety that were pulling others up so they could come out of a drowning situation in which they would surely die. And then he noticed something else, and this is the reason why he started the Salvation Army that's now global and helping so many people. He saw that there were those who had made it onto the platform who had gone up a little bit further onto the rock, and they were just soaking it in that they had been saved. And it wasn't, he said in this vision, it wasn't as if the people were unaware of the ones that were drying. In fact, they were anxious about it, but not to the level of where the few were that were reaching in and pulling others out, having come out themselves. What's our responsibility about this message of hell? What is, this, what is our responsibility and our, our response going into our ability to do something about it that comes from the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ. 